Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There's an old saying that goes, uh, if it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> that is, you're supposed to leave it alone, otherwise your meddling might make it worse. Uh, now some people have heard that we're coming up with a new outline for evangelism. And so the obvious question is, mm, what's wrong with the old outline? Didn't we get trained in it and didn't we use it to bring people to Christ? Well, yes, we did. Uh, but our old approach did have its roots in a different theological tradition, and we kind of modified it here a bit here and there. We, we saw that some parts of it seemed to contradict what the, the Bible said, so we tweaked it a little bit here and there. Uh, it was kind of a crack, and we used a little duct tape on it uh, to hold it together and fill in a few holes. After a while, though, we, we realized that the problems were more than superficial. They, they went all the way to the core. The whole thing was based on a, a faulty assumption, a faulty foundation. We, we couldn't just patch it together, or as the biblical metaphor says, to put new wine into an old wineskin. We needed to take a fresh look at the gospel and a fresh look at how we might present it to people. Uh, now, we also recognized that the old outline had some good points in it too, uh, and we were able to replicate those in the new outline. And we'll have a team of five speakers to present that. My, my part right now is to introduce it by explaining why we changed and the biblical foundation that we have for the new outline. And let me address the core issue by looking at a, a few verses from the Bible. Let's begin with 2 Corinthians 5.19. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Now, that's, that's interesting. God isn't counting our sins against us. And it's, not, and it's not just for us, it is for the whole world. He's not counting their sins against them either. A second, uh, we know that God is love, and 1 Corinthians 13 gives us a description of love. It says that love keeps no record of wrongs. And this again suggests that God is not keeping a record of all the wrong things that we've done. We could mention several other verses, but let's look at just one more. And that's Colossians 2, verse 14. Jesus canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Our common uh, language, he paid for our sins. He paid for our debts. And he did it 2,000 years ago. It, it was done, past tense, before we ever lived, long before we ever believed it. Forgiveness has been granted. God isn't waiting on us to believe it before we're actually forgiven. There's no longer any debt to speak of. Jesus paid that debt for all humanity, and he did it 2,000 years ago. And that is basically what was wrong with the old evangelism outline. Uh, in fact, it is at the core of many different evangelism outlines. They focus on guilt, on the fact that people have broken various laws of God. And the gospel is presented as kind of a, a courtroom argument in which the person is proven to be guilty. And then we learn that the penalty has been paid by Jesus. So they dredge our sins back up, uh, they count them against us, and they threaten people with punishment. They threaten people with debts that have actually have already been paid. They're not really debts. We're already forgiven. God isn't counting our sins against us. He doesn't keep a record of our mistakes. The book of our sins is already blank. So the evangelism outlines uh, typically present God as kind of a, a cranky judge uh, who's kind of upset at, merely at the fact that people don't know that somebody else has already paid their debt. Or they present a father who's kind of unaware of what his son has done, that his son has paid those debts. Uh, kind of presents a father and a son who are kind of have different <coughs> attitudes toward us. The father wants to accuse and punish, and the son wants to rescue us. But that's not biblically accurate. 
Some presentations say that our sins have created a huge chasm between us and God. But this chasm is a fiction. The chasm has already been filled in by Christ. Our sins are not a barrier that keep us away from God. Because as 2 Corinthians says, God has already reconciled the world to himself. It's, it's a unilateral declaration of peace. Reconciliation means that he doesn't harbor any grudges against us. He's not concerned about this legal category called guilt. The old outline, like many others, focuses on sin and guilt. And I agree that sin is a serious problem. And I agree that we are guilty. <laughs> We've all sinned. No doubt about that. But the Bible also says that God isn't holding that against us. It's not a barrier to our salvation. We are forgiven. Jesus paid the debt. And the payment is effective even before anyone believes it. It's unconditional. It doesn't depend on something that we have to do to make it effective. It's grace. It's not based on something that we have to do. So a guilt-based presentation of the gospel is a misrepresentation of who God is and what He's done and how we are to respond. Now, I admit that it often works. <clears throat> many people, including many of us, are already enculturated into thinking that God is cranky, <laughs> that He's angry at people, that we have to do something in order to get back on His good side. Uh, people tend to think that God is like the, the Greek god Zeus or the Norwegian god Thor, is ready to send lightning strikes on anybody who annoys Him. Uh, but the gospel should free people from errors like that rather than act like they're correct. Now, what would the gospel look like if we didn't harp about sins that have already been paid for? What if we didn't focus on guilt that God has already put aside? You know, guilt is so thoroughly ingrained in our religious culture that many people can't even imagine the gospel without a focus on guilt. They say the gospel is a gift, but they present it as a transaction, a deal. You'll be forgiven if you accept the gospel. But in reality, Jesus has already paid for your sins, and you're already forgiven. There's no if to it. God isn't counting your sins against you. But many religious people think that God is focused on our guilt, and our relationship with God is based on whether He holds us guilty. They see humanity's problem through this lens of guilt. And if we remove guilt from the equation, they, they think the gospel will have nothing left to say. If the only thing the gospel has to give us is forgiveness, and people are already forgiven, then what's the gospel for? Uh, well, consider this. Even in the old way of uh, presenting the gospel, if, if the only thing wrong with sin is that it makes us guilty, and this guilt is forgiven when we accept the gospel, then that would mean that there's then nothing wrong with sin. If the only thing wrong with sin is guilt, and the guilt's gone, then there's no reason to avoid sin. Well, that is, of course, wrong. <laughs> uh, but we need to understand why it's wrong. The problem of sin is a lot deeper than guilt. And, and the good news of the gospel is likewise a lot deeper than the removal of guilt. There's a lot more to the gospel than just a transaction by which we can be forgiven. Uh, to help us think a bit more about it, so let's consider this question. If our sins are already paid for by the death of Jesus, what then is the problem of sin? The answer is that it messes up our relationships. The reason that God says that sin is wrong is because it hurts people. It, it messes up relationships. Uh, lying, cheating, and stealing hurt our relationships with other people. Idolatry hurts our relationship with God. The reason that God tells us to avoid sin is not merely because it annoys Him, uh, but because it's not good for us. Because God loves us, He wants us to avoid the pain 
that sin causes. The reason that sin is wrong is because it hurts our relationships. And that, so that's a biblical foundation then for explaining the gospel. I, I call it evangelism focused on relationships. Another way to look at the topic is to consider what life is for. What salvation is for. Why would anybody want to go to heaven, as the common language express, puts it? Now, heaven is definitely better than the other place. Uh, but, but why is it good? The book of Revelation tells us, chapter 21, tells us that there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more death. And the passage also says that God will live with us. Now, if, if God's kind of cranky and arbitrary, then it might not sound all that attractive to spend eternity with God. But if He's loving and kind, and He really wants us to live with Him, then eternal life sounds a lot better. So it's important that we have a good concept of God. Salvation means having this never-ending relationship with an incredibly loving God. And it means never-ending relationships with each other. Relationships in which there's never any pain or suffering, never any betrayal or disappointment, never any sin. Now that sounds really good to me. We, we were made for relationships. And the reason that sin is wrong is because it hurts and disrupts those relationships. When we do wrong things, when we do things that damage our relationships, we feel guilty. Because God has given us a conscience to help us realize that something's gone wrong. But guilt isn't the only problem we have. It's only the problem in the middle. The problem of sin goes into the past and into the future. It goes backwards into our tendency to sin. We know what good and bad are. And we don't want to do bad things into our relationships. But we end up doing them anyway. We've got a problem there. And humanity seems unable to solve that problem on its own. And then we've, we've got guilt. Uh, we've got problems on the other side too. Because we have the consequences of sin, and that's the damaged relationships. Even if we could get rid of the guilt, we'd still have the problems of distrust, of hurt feelings, of fear of what other people might do to us. And then, of course, there's death. Uh, we can't solve that one either. So we've got some fundamental problems, and eternal life isn't going to be much of a reward unless all aspects of the problem are fixed. Simply living forever is not going to solve the problem. Now, I don't have time to cover all the details, but let's just say that the Bible tells us how Jesus has overcome the problem of death and he's overcome the problem of temptation and our tendency to sin. He's been there. He's fought the battle. He's won the victory. And he's giving us the t-shirt. He assures us that in the new heavens and the new earth, the problem is going to be gone. And I believe it. Even now, the Bible tells us good news that the Holy Spirit lives in us to change us, to recreate us. Uh, to fulfill the purpose for which we are created. To be the kind of people who enjoy eternal life where no one hurts anyone else. The, the Spirit helps us in our relationships as He transforms us to be more loving, more forgiving, and more like Christ. That's good news, and it's part of the Gospel. Uh, let's go back to 2 Corinthians 5 to see a little bit more about how it works in verses 18 and 19. All this is from God, Paul writes, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Reconciliation is just a, a big word for fixing broken relationships, for helping people who used to be angry at each other to become friends again. And Jesus has done that for us, to reconcile us to God. And the Bible says He's done it, past tense, for the whole world. Now, you might think, uh, 
there's a problem here. Uh, wake up and look around. Uh, the world is not on good terms with God. Uh, many people are ignoring God. Some people are even angry at God. How can the Bible say that the whole world has been reconciled to God? That's because reconciliation has two sides to it. There are two parties involved, God and humanity. From God's perspective, from God's side, the reconciliation has taken place. He isn't angry at us. He wants to restore the relationship. He doesn't count our sins against us. God doesn't hold a grudge against us or the threat of penalties. He's not hanging that over our head. The Gospel says because of what Christ has done, we are forgiven whether we believe it or not. From God's perspective, there's no animosity, no anger. He wants to restore the relationship. But Paul says that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, he's given us the job of sharing the gospel. This passage of scripture is about sharing the gospel. And part of the gospel is telling people that God isn't counting their sins against them. So our evangelism outline shouldn't be based on guilt, it should be based on forgiveness. We want people to respond to the forgiveness that's already there. Verses 19 and 20. And He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The Gospel pleads for a response from us. This is an exhortation that since God has nothing against you, you should drop your fear and dislike of God and be reconciled to Him. He extends His love to you. The Gospel urges you to give your love to Him. That's what you were made for. And the Gospel is the, the good news announcement that God has pulled out all the stops, as it were, and done everything from His side. There's no threat of revenge, no threat of getting even, no threat of punishment, because He doesn't count our sins against us. He's saying, let's be friends. Will you be my friend? Now, when we have a good relationship with God, and we let Him live in us, he will make us more like Christ, and then we will have better relationships with other people. Uh, our foundation will be right, and then we can build something that will last into eternity. The Bible has a lot to say about the way we treat one another. I don't have time to go into all that today. The, the, my point here is that the Gospel announces God's grace. The fact that He has forgiven us, and uh, that our guilt it's not a barrier between us and salvation. It's already been taken care of, already erased from the record. So our presentation of the gospel doesn't dredge up debts that have already been paid. It doesn't focus on guilt. Instead, it offers the good news of relationships, a restored relationship with God, and better relationships with other people. The, God, uh, the, the gospel announces good news and encourages us to respond to God with faith and love. God uh, is, is not just preparing new heavens and new earth for us. He's preparing us for those new heavens and new earth. He's preparing us to have a new life in which there will be no more death or sorrow or pain because God will live with us and we'll live with God forever. Love and love and peace and joy because the old way of doing things will be gone. Thank <laughs> you.